Okay, thank you for joining the DCE webinar series. Um, whilst people come into the room, I'll just do a few a few introductions, a few housekeeping um, rules. So we're really pleased to have um, Elena Chatsy as our guest speaker today. I'll hand over to um, one of the DCE editors, Elizabeth Cross, to introduce Elena in a moment. Um, but uh, just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, so the will be a, a recording made available um, and disseminated after the after the uh, after the, the webinar takes place. Um, participants, um, attendees are in listen only mode. So if you have a question or a comment, please use the Q and A or the chat, and um, we'll field those after the after the talk by Eleni. Um, there is a hashtag as well. I don't know whether anyone's ever used it, but DCE webinars. Um, uh, as you can see on the screen, so feel free to use that if you want to. If you want to tweet about this, I'll just move through the um, the slides that I've got here. So a uh, bit of information here about um, the Data Centric Engineering Journal. So I think a lot of the people who are joining this webinar will be kind of very aware of um, what we publish and the and the scope of the journal. But a bit bit of information there, and because we sort of welcome any submissions. And next slide, um, just to let you know about some upcoming webinars. Um, we have um, Stefan Bordas in October, Ricardo Vinueza in November. There may well be others between now and then, um, but we'll let all of the people who registered for the webinars kind of know about upcoming, upcoming events that are before then. Um, also just to note that there are a couple of calls for papers that are active at the moment. So we have the data-driven optimization in process engineering called Call for Papers. So um, people are very welcome to submit in response to that. And also uh, more recently, we've put together, or I should say our editors put together a uh, um, translational data-centric engineering in the marine sector um, Call for Papers. So please do check that out. Um, um, and I'll share the, share the link to that in the chat. So without, without kind of uh, taking any, any, any more time, I'll just hand over to to Lizzie now um, to introduce Eleni. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. My name is Lizzie Cross, and I'm a, a professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Sheffield. Um, I'm super excited to welcome Eleni Hatsi to our DC, DC webinar series, um, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to her talk today. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, Eleni is associate, an associate professor and chair of structural mechanics and monitoring um, at ETH Zurich. She received her PhD um, from Civil Engineering and Mechanics at Columbia University in New York. Um, and as you'll see, her research interests are around structural health monitoring, structural dynamics, nonlinear system identification, um, and intelligent life cycle assessment for engineered systems. There's a, there's a lot of data uh, kind of intertwined through all of that, throughout all of those themes. So um, I'm sure that's something that Eleni will pick up on in her, in her talk. I'm not going to embarrass her by talking about her very illustrious career so far and her very high publication rate and lots of fantastic grants in. Um, we're here to talk about the exciting research. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Eleni um, and I'll be fielding questions at, at the end of the talk. So please add them to the chat as we go along and hopefully we can have a nice kind of discussion at the end. So just so, pause to make sure we can see your screen, Eleni. Oh, uh, yes, I have to swap every time. But maybe now it's full screen, I hope. Yes, it's perfect. Thanks, Elaine. Great. Thanks for joining us. And, and over to you. Um, so, again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I want to thank you, Lizzie and Andrew, for inviting me to give a talk to what I think is really an exciting theme. So data-centric data engineering, I think it's becoming a domain, really, that tries to intertwine different fields. Um, in, a, in a bit of a paradox today, I will discuss uh, why data alone is not enough, uh, and I will try to, to put or see this concept of modeling, which is um, uh, what we are uh, working on in the Chair of Structural Mechanics and Monitoring here at ETH Zurich, and I will frame it in the context of robust dynamical systems monitoring, uh, since, as Lizzie explained, our main field of uh, study is structural health monitoring. Just to give a bit of motivation, um, I'm, I'm working in the domain of civil engineering where monitoring is a means to better understand and comprehend uh, um, and 
protect structural systems which are exposed uh, to um, uh, not only um, extreme events, but also aging and natural deterioration, which bears an impact on their performance. And so in safeguarding our, these systems that are our critical resources, um, we are investigating the use of sensors uh, within the so-called structural health monitoring uh, chain. And I call it the chain because it comprises different links of uh, equal importance. The very first link comes from data, so the acquisition of information through the use of sensors of diversified um, uh, types that uh, provide heterogeneous information on structural response is mostly our, our interest in this case. Secondly, the possibility to couple this information to models of uh, structural behavior. And again, in our case, models are drawn from the domains of mechanics and dynamics, but can also be built from data, which is something I will discuss. And the ultimate purpose of uh, gathering this information and trying to interpret this through modeling is to build indicators of the performance of the system, not only its current condition, but also potentially its residual and remaining life which in, at the end of the day allows us to support the decision on how to best go about the handling, so the operation and maintenance typically of these uh, systems. And it is of interest to not only do this on the individual unit scale, but also at the level of uh, what one would call fleets or populations, so at the level of uh, systems. Uh, today, as I already announced, as the title of the talk reveals, I will be focusing on this uh, link of the chain, which is the aspect of uh, modeling. Uh, but before I go there, I would like to explain that uh, today, through the acquisition of data, we do have the possibility to infer models on the basis of representations uh, that really draw exclusively from such data. And one such case, is a case that is of particular interest to us in our group. We heavily um, work um, or we have a domain of our uh, activities that concentrates on the, monitor on the monitoring of wind turbine infrastructure. And here in particular, uh, it is possible to, uh, uh, to have access to representative sets of data that are descriptive of what I mentioned before the system performance. So for example, by using information from SCADA data gathered from wind turbines, it is possible to uh, obtain data-driven representations that are explaining the performance of the system and even explain effects uh, that could be complex, such as the wake effect, and that are not necessarily perfectly captured by the mo models that we have available today, and which could be, in fact, limited by the number of assumptions that we have to place. So in this case, you see a model that is built on the basis of data uh, on wind speed direction um, uh, and, and uh, different locations of uh, the collection of this data, the nacelles, so at the top of these different individual wind turbines, and which allows us uh, through the use of uh, deep learning tools, in this case, conditional variational autoencoders, to build a representation of the wake phenomenon and even uh, help to understand how this impacts the performance um, of a wind turbine, uh, also in terms of its uh, engineering performance, which eventually impacts fatigue. And so at this level, we have not really needed to fuse any information from uh, the knowledge of the system at hand. Uh, what I would like to though um, uh, claim today is the fact that this is not always enough. Uh, in fact, uh, in these purely data-driven representations are very meaningful. But uh, within the context of monitoring, they would be typically useful for primarily what we call uh, the task of diagnosis. So understanding uh, what the performance of the system is. Um, to the contrary, the moment we want to understand a bit more on how the system might perform in the future. So when we want to extrapolate, uh, we typically as engineers would have to fuse in some knowledge of the physics. And this is when we want to prognose, when we want to, to, to be able to um, uh, uh, to say something more than what it is we observe through the collection of data. Now, what I would like to show today is the potency of the combination of the two, uh, what is also known as a hybrid modeling. And I know that Lizzie has a lot of work on this, uh, which is uh, also known as the domain of gray box modeling. So when we actually combine physics-based representations with the uh, data, trying to merge the best of both worlds, uh, trying to exploit uh, the knowledge that comes from physics, but also corrected on the basis of information that uh, come from the system as is. 
Now, the main problem that we're dealing with in our group is the fact that when we want to do this fusion, we have to deal with the fact that the, the physics-based representations have to be on par with data, which means they have to compute at the rate that is fast enough to allow us to do this fusion, oftentimes for tasks that need to be in real time. Uh, diagnostic tasks is on one such example. So the computational toll uh, of the physics-based representation has, has to be brought down so that in the end we can have a virtualization or a digital twin uh, as uh, often referred to of the system that can operate with data. So uh, let me explain a bit on this attempt on, mod on modeling by trying to bring down computation by fusing information from the underlying physics. And I will try to do this in stages. And so for the first stage, I will present the case uh, of uh, the monitoring again of the wind turbine structure, which is for us a, an exciting problem. Uh, with many different facets. So here I show you uh, the response of such a wind turbine, which is illustrated in the contour plot, in the frequency plot of about 10 minutes of data. Um, for those that are familiar with dynamics, you will see from this kind of spectral plot that the frequency content, so the main frequencies of the turbine are not constant. This is a non-stationary system, but they are affected or essentially they vary within this 10 minute range. Now, if I was to explore this in an even long, uh, lengthier time window over a period of a month, we see further variability, which is induced on a second level by the influence of uh, varying environmental conditions on the site or even operational conditions. So this is a challenging system for us because it has two, uh, let's say, scales of dynamics. The time periodic dynamics in the sh shorter scale or turbulence effects, and then the dependency on slower evolving environmental and operational conditions. Now we could, uh, in a data-driven representation, try to ignore the fact that we have this knowledge, but what we try to do is uh, to try and see this sort of uh, anticipated knowledge of the dynamics. And I show you here how we do this on an actual case study uh, from an op operational wind turbine uh, in Germany, in this location in Lübenau. This is a Vestas turbine, which we instrumented with some relatively cheap uh, instrumentation accelerometers across the tower in this case, which give us some information on the response of this system. And at the same time, as I mentioned before in my initiating example, there's information from turbines that is explicative of the operational and environmental parameters, the direction, the speed of the wind, the power that is produced or the temperature. And this is what I referred to before as the slower evolving, evolving environment. Um, it's also information that comes at uh, lower sampling rates, so usually averaged over a period of 10 minutes. So the challenge for us is to try and uh, fuse these two scales at, uh, in a way that is meaningful for this type of system. And to do this, we try to break the representation of the system into this hierarchical model, where in the shorter time scale, we try to tackle the dynamics using appropriate time series representations. So here is where we fuse knowledge of the dynamics. And we do this, there exist several options to do this, and I will explain some of these options uh, next. And in a second level, we try to capture the dependence on the slower evolving environment and its variables through uh, dependence models. Uh, once we have uh, constructed this hierarchical model, we use it for prediction, and we try to also uh, use it for the diagnosis of damage by comparing our anticipated response with the one we actually measure through our monitoring systems. Um, so here's how this works. Uh, first, for this time series representation, a number of options exist, uh, depending on the problem at hand. If you have a nonlinear system, it, where in structural mechanics this is quite common, if you're dealing, for example, with uh, buildings loaded under earthquake, uh, there exist parametric representations of the autoregressive type that can tackle nonlinear systems. These are nonlinear autoregressive uh, models. The same applies for non-stationary systems. You can have a parametric representation in the form of a discrete wavelet transform, which is one of many options. And for wind turbines in particular, some of our favorite representations are in, uh, in the form of time varying or linear in the parameter varying uh, autoregressive uh, models. And so this is what we will be using here. The main benefit of using such uh, parametric representation is that it tries, as I said before, to seed in some expected anticipated knowledge of the dynamics. So it biases the prediction, but in a way that tries to embody knowledge. And additionally, because they are parametric, uh, they offer the possibility to express dependence on the slower evolving uh, environmental and operational variables. And this can be done through different dependence structures. 
polynomial chaos expansion being one such choice, Gaussian process regression being another. So here for our wind turbine, if I return to that 10 minute window, you see here the capturing of the response uh, where over the contour plot, you see the overlay in blue lines of our fitted time varying autoregressive model, which can quite accurately follow the evolution of these frequencies for such a non-stationary system. This is a more accurate representation than a typical approach um, that would follow a model analysis kind of interpretation and interpretation with stationary dynamics. Now in the second level, we use this dependence model for these uh, slow evolving variables. And there's many ways to do this. Here uh, I show you, or let's say the most often used for us are polynomial chaos expansions or Gaussian process regression in this case. And I, I show you a bit of the logic. So in the second level, we take the previously computed parametric dynamic uh, models for the short-term windows, and we condition them uh, on the basis of SCADA information. So wind direction, power, uh, RPM of the rotor, the yaw, so orientation of the nacelle. And we try to train a model, uh, a stochastic model actually, uh, which uh, is whose error we then, we then try to track in an effort to form a diagnostic index. So this is a better view of how this works. A training period uh, where our hierarchical, hierarchical model is trained. Here you see our observation of the error, uh, which starts becoming uh, useful in the, um, in the prediction mode. Here we expect, or likely we will observe outliers between what we expect and what is actually measured. But of course, uh, this is not enough. We need to then try and track uh, these outliers, understand which of these outliers are persistent, and if they are, what this means in the space of our, um, uh, uh, of our error plot. So here you see one of the diagnostic, the types of diagnostic plots that we would construct, where uh, in normal operating conditions, we expect everything to lie within our predicted thresholds for the error. In situations where this does not happen, and especially if it happens in uh, an area of our model where we expect the uh, training to be valid because it's under inputs that we have observed before, so known wind direction or experienced wind directions uh, and uh, speeds, then this is something that gives us a red alarm, which is something we translate as a diagnostic indicator. Or it is possible to have outliers in areas of this plot where the diagnosis uh, where the potency of our diagnosis is actually um, uh, questionable in the sense that we are observing for the first time specific environmental and operational variables. And here we issue a yellow alarm because we cannot necessarily claim that the, the, the prediction is valid, but uh, we know that something seems to be off. Either our model needs to be retrained or it's a potential alarm. And so we use this type of red, green, uh, amber alarm type of system in many of uh, the tools we develop. We have found that this is particularly meaningful for operators and engineers who would like to interpret these alarms in a way that prompts them on how to react. Uh, but of course, what I'm describing here is a task of diagnosis. If we go a step further, uh, we have also shown that one can rely on the distribution of sensors on a network. So here I show you not the wind turbine, but the bridge where the principle is the same, it is possible with such methods to understand if damage could exist. And on the basis of the uh, distribution of the different sensors, even pick up the regions where this damage could uh, occur. Multiple metrics have been uh, suggested for this throughout the literature, and not only from us, but from the whole community. We have shown that such metrics, in fact, are valid even in practical, uh, and more so in practical case studies. Uh, here you see an application on controlled damaging of a bridge here in Switzerland, where we show indeed that localization is possible, provided that we have the right type of sensors installed in an appropriate distribution. But all uh, that I'm describing so far is really uh, uh, referring to the task of diagnosing, understanding if damage exists and where it possibly lies. Now, the next uh, level that I also uh, referred to in the opening of the talk would be prognosis. So to understand how much further the system can go and even quantify in a better way what is the current damage so as to know what to expect for future performance. So in this case, 
we need to bring more of the physics into the representation, meaning beyond the principles of dynamics that I tried to see in earlier, now mechanics also comes into play. But in this case, we're now uh, starting to discuss finite element model representations, at least for our structural systems. And this implies a lot of computational toll, which is not necessarily easy to combine with data, at least not in affordable time scales. There are many ways to work on reduction of these physics-based models, mechanics, mechanics models, so as to make them computationally affordable. And we work on a number of these in domains of fracture, uh, plasticity, uh, nonlinear um, uh, phenomena due to large deformations or complex structures. But today I would like to show you an approach that relies on exploitation of the machine learning approach for producing what we call reduced order models of expensive numerical simulations. And again, this is in an effort to bring computation down to the level where it can be combined with data. So here I show you a random uh, imagined uh, structural system, usually discretized with a number of uh, elements, resulting in a large number of degrees of freedom, a large dimensional system, uh, which uh, actually can, uh, we have shown through the work of Tom, Thomas Simpson in collaboration actually with Nikos Dervilis from the University of Sheffield. Uh, we have shown that this system, which lies in a large dimensional space, can be passed through an autoencoder structure or even a variational autoencoder when a certain quantification is of interest to bring the dimensionality down. And in this case, uh, resulting in a few parameters that describe the system, even, even if this is a non-linear system representation, we uh, retain this very, this lower dimensional space, which we then try to condition with physical inputs. So uh, this framework we have developed primarily for the purpose of substructuring. So here we usually map this lower dimensional space, which is non-physical, to a physical forcing at the boundaries of our domain. And we try here to solve a dynamical uh, uh, system. And we do this by using an LSTM, uh, which takes uh, our representation in the lower dimension to the next point in time. And at the same time, through use of the variational autoencoder, by using the inverse representation, the inverse mapping, the decoder step, we can go from that lower dimensional state, now in the next point in time, back to the full dimension of the system. And in this case, we gain in computation uh, to the point where, in fact, we can be as fast as the data that is extracted from a dynamical system. Uh, we have demonstrated this for the case of um, a benchmark, which we created specifically for, for those interested in structural health monitoring. This is maybe one of the most common structures that one tries to use for nonlinear representations. It is a shear frame. Uh, which is equipped with nonlinear nodes. The nonlinear nodes follow a hysteretic behavior that is governed by a book one type of model. So a model whose hysteretic nonlinear loop looks like what you see here. And you have to imagine that in this frame, all of the nodes have the potency, the potential to evolve uh, or follow this nonlinear behavior. And we have shown that such a reduced representation can very successfully replace a full order finite element model and achieve a computation that is in a fraction of seconds. So indeed something that can be done in real time. If interested in such a benchmark, uh, this is openly available. So you would find it um, published um, and it's open for use also by others for verification of their approaches in reduced order modeling or even uh, damage detection uh, for nonlinear systems. Now, a bit of an issue in what I showed before is that we can do this reduction and, of course, if it's for a particular problem and particular structure of fixed parameters, it's rather easier to do, but it's not as generalizable. And because we're working in structural health monitoring and we want to be able to uh, examine damage, it's important for us to be able to parameterize uh, our systems. So for that previous frame, I would like to have the opportunity to have a reduced order model, which is not exclusive to a specific configuration, but can capture the system for different properties of this um, frame, material properties, geometrical properties, but also different properties of the input. So different spectral and temporal characteristics of an input earthquake, for instance, which is the usual load for this, build, for this kind of an example. Um, 
To do this, we follow a slightly different approach where we try to reduce our problem using a physics-based uh, reduction strategy. And uh, the way in which this is achieved is through the use of uh, proper orthogonal decomposition, again, for a system that is assumed to be nonlinear, either due to geometric nonlinearities or material nonlinearities. We use proper orthogonal decomposition. We try to uh, extract the basis that brings our representation of the equation of motion of the system through from the original large n-dimensional system to a dimension r that is much uh, more reduced. For those that are uh, familiar with dynamics, this is uh, equivalent to a model representation, uh, but now also applying for the nonlinear case. And we try to develop these bases, this Galerkin projection that uh, allows us to achieve this reduction uh, across the field of the parametric domain that we are exploring. So, in a way, this, uh, we try to approximate the local manifolds in the parameter space, which we then try to sample so that we can extract these reduced representations, these reduced dynamic equation of motion that we can then solve in an easier way, uh, in a fast enough way to combine with uh, data. Uh, here is one of the simplest uh, uh, examples, but it's helpful for me to make a point. So here you see a typical uh, structural system, a beam type of structure, which could have a nonlinear domain, uh, which, uh, so here is in gray is this nonlinear domain, which is surrounded by a linear uh, domain. Again, here uh, it is of interest to couple these approaches to uh, substructuring, where we try to reduce the linear and nonlinear space with different, uh, let's say, bases. And at the end of the day, we try to build a system uh, that uh, can compute uh, on the basis of this reduced equation that I showed you before. So uh, in this case, we try to do this in a parametric context. Uh, the parameters that here play a role are both on the system traits. So here is the yield stress, a parameter of the material, but also a characteristic of the excitation, uh, the temporal and spectral characteristics of the input of the forcing of this nonlinear cantilevered beam, which is excited at its, uh, at its base. And here you see um, the prediction or rather the matching between the high fidelity model and the parametric reduced order model approximation. Um, in this case, uh, it is uh, not so much the speed up that we are interested in, which uh, of course is also uh, important, but uh, it is further this uh, result here. The fact that we can extract uh, um, uh, parameters, not parameters, but uh, outputs of the problem that relate directly to the quantities which we measure. For example, in these systems, we're particularly interested in monitoring strains and uh, by association stresses. And this is something that we can recover by using these physics-based reduced order approximations. Uh, in order to uh, demonstrate how this works in the problem that uh, shows the uh, the full circle, so from data extraction to the simulation of these systems using a uh, reduced order approach, I show you this uh, example on virtual sensing, which essentially is uh, one of our uh, uh, main uh, problems in monitoring. Uh, I show you the example uh, here of an aerospace structure, uh, uh, the representation of a wing, where we assume that we have some sparse, typically, um, um, network of sensors. Uh, you can imagine that these are strain or accelerometer sensors. And we would like to, to be able to exploit this uh, a model and the underlying physics in order to predict the response of the system in uh, uh, locations further to those that are being monitored. And we want to do this with the aim of identifying uh, effects that are critical to the condition of the system, such as, for instance, cracking in such a, such a problem. Now, to do this, we have to join uh, data or monitoring observations together with the system model. And we, uh, we have been doing this for years. We have years we have been working with Bayesian filtering approaches to uh, try and effectuate the merger of the two. Now, how does Bayesian filtering work? I will not go into the details, but I will roughly describe uh, the problem where we have a system where the inputs, so the loads to the system are usually in fact unknown or um, may be measured, but with uncertainty. We have an a priori model of the system, which could be, again, uncertain or not completely defined in terms of its parameters. Um, and we also have some 
And we would also like to predict the response of the system, as I said before, possibly in unmeasured locations, the task of virtual sensing, with the purpose of extracting information that uh, could uh, lead us to the diagnosis of damage or even the understanding of deterioration that is being accumulated into the system. Now, there's a number of uh, problems in trying to, um, uh, to identify such systems. One is uncertainty, so the noise in the measurements and the unknown information we might have on the system, the fact that maybe the, um, the operating structure is nonlinear, the fact that our observations are usually scarce, and so we want to be able to also uh, virtually uh, sense in uh, further locations, and the fact that the system can be complex and that's uh, uh, with lar of large dimensionality. Now, aspects two and four, I already described that I will try to tackle with these parametric reduced order models. Uh, what I want to show next is how the data comes into the equation. And this is where the Bayesian uh, filtering framework uh, plays a big role. Um, on the one hand, we have this uh, representation of the system, uh, of the dynamical system, which for us, as I explained up to now, would come from a reduced order model. So a model that can compute fast. On the other hand, we have some sparse observations of the system, which I will try to use uh, for correcting my uh, usually faulty prediction uh, on the basis of the model. To do this, I will follow a Bayesian framework, which comprises two steps. A prediction step, where I simply use the model to go one step ahead in time, and I do the best I can on the basis of model knowledge. And secondly, an update or correction step, where the discrepancy between what I predict and what I actually measure is exploited in order to offer a correction to the previous prior estimate of the response. By doing this correction, uh, I'm optimally conditioning the response or uh, I'm, I'm improving the posterior estimate of the response, even in locations that are actually not uh, measured. And this is the virtual uh, sensing task. One of the tools we use to do this is the particle-based filters and the uncentered Kalman filter which try to um, exploit or represent the uncertainty of the system. And they usually do this through representing our state of the system uh, as a stochastic variable, uh, represented by some particles that reflect the mean and the variance of the system. Uh, these particles can then be fed through the equation of motion. As I said before, it's my prediction step. We get some prior estimate at the next point in time. And then at the correction step, we pass these particles through the a measurement equation. Through the use of that discrepancy, I can correct and obtain an improved uh, posterior. We have been using this kind of premise uh, for different types of systems, but I will show you here an example which combines this with the reduction approach that I showed before. And I'll do this for this problem of an aerospace system, where I try to um, detect damage, possible presence of damage on the fuselage of this aerospace structure, assuming that I have some sensors uh, that are deployed onto the system, a uh, few sparse sensors on the basis of which I'll try to detect the possible uh, location and presence, presence and location of a crack. So I will use the physics-based reduction approach um, and this, uh, where the parameters in this case will be the possible location, orientation and size of a crack or a defect in, that, in this fuselage structure. Um, this is actually a bit more complex than the few details that I gave earlier because we have a problem where the crack is a, a discontinuity in our system that can change location. This can have a very important effect on the basis that I'm trying to build. And in order to solve this issue, we have used the mesh morphing approach. This is a, a, essentially a trick um, which is uh, done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Agathos from the University of Exeter now. It's a trick that allows us in a very intelligent way to try and build bases that are robust, even for these kinds of discontinuous systems. And at the end of the day, to build such reduced order models, where actually the speed of this video is uh, pretty much, it's actually even slower than the speed in which the uh, the system is solved. So we can solve this plate under assumptions of different locations of cracks uh, onto the system uh, in a matter of uh, seconds, uh, fast enough uh, to assume that this is at the scale in which we are obtaining the data. And so this is what we did. Uh, since we can, we can have such a fast model, we can solve it in parallel using the Bayesian filtering framework that I explained before, where the model is fused with these observations from select locations of that plate. 
and where the parameters of the model are the different potential uh, parameters of the crack of, into the system. And by uh, using uh, the observations in parallel with uh, the model, we're able to understand uh, or at the end of the day, identify what are the characteristics of this crack. So what is the location, possible orientation? You see here the convergence of the algorithm as the evaluation continues. It's, it's also important to mention that together here with the filter, we're also combining an optimization approach, the CMAS algorithm for finding the optimal location uh, of these assumed uh, cracks. So in this example, um, this is maybe not so important, we show a comparison also of the computational uh, time, uh, or uh, here is the more important step, the solution time for a full order model uh, would be 71 seconds. It could be dropped with some techniques even to 22 seconds, uh, but for the reduced order model, it's really the fraction uh, of second uh, that would require to uh, uh, perform this computation and really enables us at the end of the day to solve uh, the inverse problem. And this kind of an approach, which relies on the use of Bayesian filtering, has been extended by us. Uh, we have delivered methodologies that are able to operate for non-smooth systems, meaning systems where uh, you have the parameter space shifting from a linear to a non-linear system. Um, in these kinds of spaces, you have issues with observability. For example, the parameters of elasticity that are applicable in this range should not be observed in a perfectly plastic system. This means that here, while a system is moving in this range, uh, the observability of the system does not allow to recover inversely this uh, parameter. So we have given a number, uh, we have proposed approaches. This is also with Manuel Skadis from the University of Oxford to solve this problem in the context of Bayesian filtering. We have also uh, shown use of these filters for spatial temporal problems where we try to not only predict in terms of time but also in terms of uh, space. Uh, but I, I leave this for those that are interested to, to see in, uh, in our relevant literature. What I would like to now uh, touch upon is uh, the aspect of uh, tackling model discrepancy, because the structure that I showed earlier is a bit strict in that it assumes a good enough representation of our system, even if the parameters are not perfectly known. It assumes that the structure of a model should exist that more or less can capture what is going on. Uh, but of course, in real operating systems, this is not necessarily the case. Model error can exist, and of course, this is not this is something that would uh, uh, harden the solution of the inverse problem. So to make this concrete, I will show you a concrete example from a project that we have in Singapore uh, that is on the assessment of the condition of roadway of transportation infrastructure. Here we're develop developing a platform, uh, a relatively cheap platform, uh, a sensor platform that relies on the use of accelerometers which can be mounted on different types of vehicles and which can be used to assess the condition of the transport infrastructure that is being traversed uh, by these vehicles. So, of course, on the basis of the dynamic information that is collected, usually in the form of accelerations. So we're going for an indirect type of infrastructure assessment using mobile sensing as a means. Now, to solve this problem, uh, we could try to follow the process that I mentioned before, but this would necessitate that our model of the interacting system of the vehicle and the substrate is a very accurate one. And this is uh, hardly ever possible for these uh, actual systems to achieve. So here we need to tackle model discrepancy. And we do this by fusing our partial knowledge of the system so even if it is faulty, some partial knowledge of an interaction between the vehicle and the road in this case would exist. And we complement this with a discrepancy or error term that is being learned from data. So data here help us complement our faulty knowledge of the system by making up for what it is that physics cannot, uh, or our assumed physics cannot account for. So we're creating uh, essentially um, a neural network architecture, a physics informed neural network architecture, which we bias on purpose by fusing a physics based uh, term. And uh, here's how this works. So here again, our model is typically the uh, interacting model of a vehicle that is traversing a, a substrate, a structure. We 
put this partial knowledge, this physics-based model into the transition term of a deep Markov model in this case. And we also allow an error term, uh, a learning-based term to be learned from the data. So here we have two, actually, uh, if you read our uh, now upcoming MSSP paper, it's three neural networks that have to be learned. But uh, one of these forces the underlying state of the system to be physical. And this is what we here gain by fusing partial uh, knowledge of the physics we obtain latent space representations that are closer to the physics um, uh, that we expect mm -hmm. and not some arbitrary uh, representation that doesn't have physical connotation. For those that are more interested in these architectures, uh, you, would, you will find this in this uh, upcoming paper, but uh, essentially what uh, this uh, uh, comprises is the traditional transition and emission model of a deep Markov model, where the additional element is this term here, which is parallel to the learning-based term. And this is the physics-based uh, representation. So in this case, I will show you how this works for the case of roadway assessment on a simulated example, uh, where I show you the influence of fusing a physics-based term and a learned uh, term. Uh, this the fusion of the two is actually also through a parameter that is learned, the weight parameter that will be learned by the model. But here I'm forcing this parameter to show you the um, performance. So here we have an accelerometer assumed on the basis on the wheels of this uh, vehicle, and we try to recover the roughness of the road that is being traversed. So the roughness profile, which is actually the uh, load to the system. And so if you uh, put too much weight on the physics or uh, more weight or equal weight on physics and just the data term, uh, you see that you don't get so much of a good performance. For physics, it starts becoming better after a while. But the optimal term at which the two can be combined is something that is actually a compromise of what is the partial knowledge of the system and what can be learned from data. We're actually now uh, implementing this on actual on real rides. Uh, it's a collaboration with the SMART uh, MIT uh, group in Singapore who have given us access to their uh, vehicle that we have now instrumented with this experimental uh, platform. We are pursuing these methods uh, not only from the point of view of the deep Markov model architecture that I showed you here, but also through trying uh, through a neural extended Kalman filter, where again we try to see the more structure into the neural network architecture. But the principle is the same: we force some part of the physics, and a part we leave a part that is uh, unaccounted for to be learned by the data. And we also try to see the constraints that try to respect our, the physics of our dynamics problems. Uh, this is also done through the use of symplectic encoders. And this is the team in Singapore that is uh, heavily developing these tools, uh, where you, Tsilulai, and Kiran Baksa. I show you here a concrete implementation on an example um, on the use of um, a neural extended Kalman filter. So this is actually a wind turbine blade, which we have tested in our lab. So this is a, a climatic chamber in our Institute of Structural Engineering. We have instrumented this blade with a number of accelerometers and strain gauges, and we have made it a benchmark for the com community, for those that are interested in using uh, data for damage detection. We have tested it in healthy conditions, but also after creation of a number of different damages of diversified intensity. Uh, of course, as you may expect, we do not have a perfect model that describes the system. We have a good enough updated model, but not one that is perfect. And this is why this is a great candidate to try and implement this framework on. So these are the different scenarios of the damages, different classes of damages for this um, blade. Um, which we excited in a dynamic fashion. We extract measurements from these sparse uh, network of diverse sensors. And we try to take our faulty, uh, as I said before, our oversimplified model, combine it with this uh, neural uh, uh, extended Kalman filter. And you see here our prediction of the response after having trained the model on healthy data. You see that we can actually quite well capture the anticipated response for our healthy system. But the same would not apply for the case of a faulty system. Uh, in this case, uh, it would be harder. I mean, there would be a discrepancy between what we predict and, and what we can actually uh, observe uh, from the system. And we use this kind of discrepancy now uh, to try and see if we can classify damage, which indeed can be done in a quite robust way. We can separate the categories of damage that we have created 
uh, into this uh, system by simply following this kind of uh, logic where our trained model um, uh, or a, a principal component analysis on our predictive model can generate these different classes uh, of, the, uh, of the response, which indicate a different condition of the system. And as a very last um, uh, part, and I see I have about four minutes, so I'll keep it short. I would like to show you what can be done next. So after having constructed these hybrid models, which try to do or try to optimally diagnose and prognose possibly the response of the system, we would like to use in the, this information for decision support. And to show this concept, I will stay on a topic that is close to my previous example. It's the topic of railway infrastructure assessment from mobile sensing data. Again, uh, sensors that are mounted on uh, the axle boxes of these trains. This is data we have in collaboration with the federal railway authorities that have been very um, uh, good in offering a series of such information, which we then exploit for condition assessment. A very simple way to extract uh, an indication of condition from acceleration data turns out to be what is known uh, as the longitudinal level of the rails. It's basically a morphology of the rails that can also be extracted from integration of accelerations and which can be uh, also uh, treated in what is known as a fractal value indicator. The details for this is not so important. The important aspect is that for every position of the track, there is a way for us to develop an indicator of the condition. But of course, the point is, what do you do with the information on evolution of this indicator as the time progresses, or uh, when an action is taken onto the system, a corrective action for improving the condition? To solve this problem, we create uh, essentially uh, this uh, uh, decision support framework that is that relies on the on the concept of sequential decision making. So we have a system which we monitor, uh, which we have some uncertain information on through monitoring. We uh, assume corrective actions, and we would like to point the operators and the authorities in the best way, the best strategy to follow, the best actions to take to minimize the overall costs in an anticipated horizon. Now, this is a known problem, uh, which is typically solved using a markup decision framework. We uh, use or we follow, let me go a bit faster, another alternative, which is shown here. And this is the partially observable markup decision framework, where essentially uh, the uh, MDP is relaxed by assuming that our observations are not completely certain, that they are uh, partially uh, that the system is partially observable. So there's some uncertainty in what we collect. And this is the truth. Our measurements are indeed never perfect. So to solve this problem, uh, we can solve this partially observable mark of decision type of framework. Uh, we have done this for this railway problem by trying to also infer the deteriorating model of this system that we observe and we infer this directly from data by looking at the evolution of these fractal values we try to extract the representation of the system a hidden markov model that can follow uh, this kind of deterioration of the system and which can also quantify the probability that our system transitions from one state of the system to the other and of course here the states reflect condition and uh, because the problem mono is tends to have a monotonicity one state reflects a healthy state of the system and as this progresses uh, it moves to more deteriorated states and we can see what is the probability of this evolution if we do nothing on the system so it's just uh, naturally deteriorates if we take a specific action which could be minor in railway infrastructure tamping, for example, is such a minor action. Or if we completely replace the system, a renewal action, which is a heavy action, would have a corresponding different effect onto the system. By identifying these probabilities and navigating the space of options, it is possible to deliver a strategy to the operator on what is the best action to take, different intensities, but also the best observation to then take to understand where the system lies. So here we try to do a mapping of the management of the system, a mapping of how to navigate the space of actions uh, and inspections uh, of, of such a system. So with this, I try to close the chain that I showed in the beginning. Uh, I leave you with these uh, thoughts, which is what we will try to do here, to fuse physics and knowledge from models so that we can turn our decisions 
or we can support our decisions through explainable and interpretable tools. And uh, this uh, has been achieved through the work of a number of uh, members of this team, which you see featured uh, in the slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Eleni, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Such an informative talk with um, so much to think about. Um, pause for breath, but there's a few questions uh, that have come in already and uh, we have some time for questions. Maybe I should stop the share. Because <laughs> I you, guess. You, yeah, up to you. Because I don't see you now. Yeah, no, okay. Okay. You can see me now. Um, so uh, please feel free to add more questions, uh, audience members, as we go along. But I'll start off with uh, one that came in um, to the Q&A. So this question came in before your last section where you were talking about kind of time varying behavior. So um, we'll bear in mind that you might have already partially answered some of this. Mm -hmm. um, so Hussein says, as far as I've noticed, most of your diagnostic models work based on normal behavior modeling. Um, but as we know, the pattern of systems, normal behavior changes over time. Mm -hmm. In other words, industrial systems, data distributions will be different as we, as we age. Do you think we can use these physics-induced biases in modeling to detect whether new outliers are associated with system faults or just typical trends of distribution changes in systems behavior? Yeah, I mean, the point is uh, that these exact tools can be used. And actually, that's how we use them uh, for tracking the behavior over time. And in fact, tracking the outlier evolution over time can help create clusters even in an unsupervised manner. This is quite typical of what we do. We can try to... Uh, uh, and also the group in Sheffield has a lot of work on this. We can use probabilistic distances, either point to distribution distances like Mahalanobis distances or KL divergence metrics to try and cluster the space of outliers. And at one point, uh, if it's an unsupervised framework, place a threshold on the basis of which you then progress to a second uh, uh, or a, a next condition of your system. And this is a very typical approach. On top of this, what I showed in the end is that you can, from data, understand also the deterioration model that can govern the system. And you can do this using this kind of a hidden Markov model approach. You can do this using reinforcement um, uh, learning at the end of the day. Uh, and so it's all of these approaches can tie together. The problem with using the physics-based models is that every time you would need to condition them and inversely identify these models so that they best fit the condition of the system as is at a given point in time. But of course, this is also something one should do in the context of a digital twin, for example. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna move over to take some questions from the chat, bit, uh, the chat section. Um, so the first one says, uh, thanks for the talk. Could you elaborate please on the mesh morphing approach and in what aspect do you flatten the mesh or geometry? Ah, I mean, this is, this is a nice question. So uh, it, it requires a bit more detail <laughs> than maybe I, I, I would uh, have the luxury to go into. But essentially what the mesh morphing tries to do uh, is to use a reference graph configuration um, and a reference, uh, let's say, uh, mesh uh, which is then distorted through um, a distortion of the geometry. We're able to use always the same reference mesh, but every time move it as the crack moves in space and orientation. And the reason why we want to do this is because we have the same reference nodes. And then when we try to build the basis for our system, the reference is back uh, is always with respect to the initial degrees of freedom, even if they're now distorted and transformed. But uh, this is essential because the bases are then consistent for the different configurations. And this is a nice solution for this kind of problem where really you have to deal with a discontinuous representation of the parametric uh, space. You wouldn't have this problem in other contexts where you're dealing with material and geometric nonlinearities. But in this case, it's necessary because the crack is uh, indeed something discontinuous uh, in the domain. Excellent, thank you. Okay, a question from George. It says, uh, how many full order models do we need to train uh, a ROM in the frame of structural mechanics for damage detection? Well, this is a good question, but again, it depends a bit on the, on the problem. Um, there exist different approaches to construct these parametric reduced order models. One of the approaches is to do this using local basis um, approximations. And this means we have to separate our parametric space in a grid, essentially, which we hope is not too dense. Now, the more nonlinear the problem is, the more problematic is to build a grid that is sparse. 
And then if it's not sparse, you need more full order model approximations. We have tried to solve this problem by doing a dual projection uh, in, our, uh, in our work, which means um, we try to separate our space, uh, but then we also try to take these bases and uh, project them one step further into a more reduced set of coefficients. And we're now showing that this could help save the number of uh, full order model evaluations because it helps keep the grid rather sparse. But of course, depending on the problem, how this continues or how maybe chaotic it is, it could be that you need more full order model evaluations. The good thing is that one can claim this can happen at an offline training stage. But even at that stage, for us, it's important to try and reduce the computational load because we're talking about the very ex expensive simulations. Okay, so there was a, um, a follow up there um, from the same person just to say, what are the main fields of interest, um, I presume, in SHN, um, following up from FEA, strain or stress, that, um, et cetera? The main interests for uh, that are tied to. I assume what are you, what are we wishing to extract? Ah, okay, from a finite element analysis, for example. Another good question because I didn't have the time to explain the different type of uh, sensors that we well, that are available. But typically, uh, when discussing SHM, uh, we we are discussing the automated and to the degree feasible continuous. Well, the continuous and to the degree feasible automated monitoring which is usually effectuated with uh, sensors that measure dynamics. And it, this could be acceleration in most cases, it could be strain through conventional strain gauges or even distributed fiber optical sensors that give strain information over a quite uh, spatially dense uh, interval, either along the line, usually along the line if it's fiber optics, uh, it could be tilt meters, so it could be rotation, it could be displacement, but with a higher degree of uncertainty. These are typically the quantities you care to, to extract, but certainly strain is very interesting. And it's also a bit challenging because it's not, um, this is usually where you need physics, you need something to translate, um, um, uh, you know, what uh, the response of the system into actually measured strains. Uh, it's not as simple as interpolating uh, displacement fields, for example. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question next from Lawrence. Um, I should check, Elena, you still got, are, are we okay for time? Yeah, to find. that's okay. Fantastic. Um, do you find that the VAE autoencoders are highly sensitive to overtraining when it comes to extrapolating the decoupled states and decoding back to nonlinear states? Or simply as expected, do you think there's some way to encode physics also into the encoder decoder projections? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, of course, our, our hope is for, uh, at least for the systems that we have implemented it on. Um, I have to say for the work of Tom, for example, we started from fixed configurations back in, in what I presented. And there it was, uh, it was not uh, so challenged. So even the plain autoencoder would work for us, uh, for uh, the kind of nonlinearities that we were looking at. But of course, it can be much more complex when you start discussing parametric now dependence. It wouldn't be as robust if there was this was extended for different parameters. In this case, what we tried to do uh, was to try and combine the logic of this physics-based reduced order models with the reduction of the autoencoder, and we implement we implemented this reduction at the level. I didn't go into that detail in my presentation, but. When you're doing physics-based reduced order models, there is a, a second level of reduction. We, in fact, uh, uh, try to use few elements to reproduce the nonlinear term of the response. So not all of the finite elements, but only a few elements. In that step, we try to use the autoencoder exactly to do this that was suggested, to, to fuse physics, uh, to join physics together with the autoencoder. And this works very well, in fact. And the reason was really what was mentioned here. The plain autoencoder is good for some uh, main uh, configurations, but not very flexible when you start playing with parameters and uh, other aspects of the model. Thank you. Okay, we still have a few more questions if we're okay to carry on. Um, I'll probably call it a day once we've got through these, uh, these that are already here. Um, but thank you to the audience for being so, um, so active. Um, so a question from Sikander says, uh, what's the major advantage of reduced order modeling as compared to a rigorous nonlinear FEA? 
Ah, well, Rico is not linear FEA will always be great. The, the, uh, the problem is time. Uh, and I tried to make this point. Um, again, in the context of structural health monitoring, we're usually solving inverse problems. And when we say inverse problems, even if you don't want to solve your problem in real time, because maybe you want to have the diagnostics of a turbine failing very fast, let's say this is not the case, uh, you still want to be able to build this digital twin, right? So you want to be able to uh, update your model to reflect reflect the truth. But if you have a, a, a rigorous, a rigorous nonlinear analysis that takes hours to solve, this is almost impossible to do in an inverse setting that usually requires multiple computations of the model. Whether you're following an attention updating framework or a deterministic optimization task, you will need to do multiple evaluations of that model. And this is the reason why you have to resort to, to reduction. Thank you. Quite a specific question uh, next. In a highly nonlinear system where the nonlinearities are concentrated in a specific location, um, how accurate are our health monitoring systems that are based on low amplitude uh, oh. vibration, yeah. if they are? <laughs> um, and the question is kind of in the context of uh, wave type motion, i.e. earthquakes. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, of course, the answer there is that they're not effective. <laughs> but I, I can explain how they can be effective. So, for instance, um, I assume that this question comes in the context of vibration-based monitoring, which is a global type of monitoring system. And what do we mean by global? We mean that it is a system that is expected to pick up damage when this affects global quantities, like the model shapes or the overall model frequencies. A very localized damage is not typically going to have such an effect. But usually, localized damages would have to occur, or we expect will occur, in hot spots, hot spot locations of the system, which should have their own dedicated uh, monitoring approach. So, for example, you could have a strain, usually strain is one of the favorite ways to do this, you could have a strain uh, system, if it, if it has to be low cost, near such a hot spot location, we could then, uh, uh, instead of using continuous monitoring, also fuse some uh, non-destructive evaluation type of techniques for these systems. What we are very excited about is the fact that today we can try and use guided wave-based methods in a continuous sense. So you could have uh, piezos around that area that you suspect is a critical area and continuously monitor it and pick up changes due to the changes in the wave propagation that come at very at higher frequencies. So now we're not talking about global behavior, we're talking about really a sensing of that dedicated region. But this is true. There always has to be a balance between what you expect to monitor and monitor and what, where you suspect damage can occur in the system. So engineering judgment will never be replaced. We're going to need to use that in many of the designs of these uh, systems. Perfect. Thanks, Eleni. Million, do million dollar question from, uh, from Maximilian. In what degree are these predictions and decision models accepted in industry? Well, I mean, this is a very good question again. In the, in the, I feel that in industrial asset uh, sort of industries, so if we're talking about bearings, it is more common today to adopt diagnostics that come directly from data and even from hybrid models. In uh, wind turbine systems, I also feel we're a bit more advanced in convincing the operators to engage in the use of these systems. And actually, they're to a degree doing it already, as particularly for offshore uh, structures. This virtual sensing uh, has one of uh, our students, actually, Silvia Vettori, is implementing this for Siemens PLM, who are uh, working with aerospace and wind energy structures. But when you go into structural engineering and your conventional civil systems, like uh, bridges, which is a good example of that, you will see that people or operators are more reluctant. And I think a reason for this is also the relative, uh, well, the lower familiarization of the of these engineers with the use of these uh, systems. Today, um, many of our colleagues, including myself, were engaged in a dialogue with operators. So now in my case, currently we're drafting a guideline for use of uh, SHM systems uh, together with the Federal Roads Office here in Switzerland. I think parallel efforts of this type are also uh, evolving exactly to achieve uh, this kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, create a, a bigger sense of comfort with the use of these technologies. Fantastic. 
So Eleni, if you have the energy, there's just a, a couple of questions from one last uh, one last question, if that's okay. And hopefully yeah, sure. we'll kind of end at about 10 past. So, um, okay. First one, if we're trying to detect a moving crack, shouldn't the physics-based model reflect this time evolution of the crack? Yeah, and this is a good point, and you can. So you can also have a, a criteria for propagation of the crack. This is possible because the reduced order model comes from the full order model reduction. It would be possible to do this. But in practice, it's not entirely necessary if the evolution of the crack is rather slow, because it's almost as uh, one is trying to identify a static track crack at different um, epochs, so at different times of its evolution. I guess it depends on uh, the speed at which you, uh, one would expect the phenomenon to evolve. If it's at, at the speed where it really uh, the evolution is, the propagation is fast, then this has to be incorporated in the model. If it's something that is relatively slow, it is okay to also do it in windows, assuming that it's a static crack every time at different uh, configurations. Um, next part. Since you're using a convex combination of physics-based model and uh, you're learning the model error with the uncert uncertainty part, is there a way of estimating the optimal value for the mixing parameter alpha oh, yeah. phase, other than the experimental one? Oh, other than the experimental one. I'm not sure I understand the question. I, oftentimes I fear that I confuse the audience because I want to show the mixing and I'm forcing this alpha, but that's not the case. The actual um, implementation, we are inferring the alpha. It's a parameter that is also learned as an optimal parameter that minimizes the likelihood, the discrepancy between what we measure and what we predict. Uh, but of course, it's learned on the basis of data. And I'm not sure now if the question means would there be another way to learn the mixing other than data? I'm afraid not. <laughs> yeah. Because indeed, what the discrepancy tries to make up for is what the model cannot, uh, cannot really uh, predict. Not, and that's unknown. So, yeah. Okay, last one. Um, does the nature of the nonlinearity under study, uh, for example, hard or soft nonlinearity, um, have any impact on the overall performance of your hybrid system, your physics and your data? Yeah, again, it's a good uh, question. It has a, an impact. It has a huge impact both on the reduction strategy because uh, nonlinearity that is abrupt uh, might uh, eventually need um, a finer discretization of the parametric space. And we go back to the previous question. This would mean more evaluations of the full order model and on the other hand, its inference, the inverse problem solution is also harder. And this is why um, it was a very brief slide, but I referred to the fact that uh, when you have non-smooth systems, maybe because you have something that is abruptly, uh, maybe not linear, that is not smooth, uh, there are specific ways to revise this Bayesian estimation problem so that it can become more efficient, specifically for these kinds of systems. So there's an impact again, in, in multiple facets of this framework uh, when, when this happens. Fantastic. Okay, Eleni, I think we are going to call it a day, but um, thank you ever so much. Fantastic talk, some really fascinating insight, uh, especially no, when you thank you. the questions. Um, also, yeah, the, the, these were great questions, by the way, so I'm very yeah, happy to <laughs> to the audience for those, yeah. those, really good, uh, those really good questions especially kind of impressive in those of us in Europe, kind of later in the day, some really good <laughs> All the more so, you're right. Yeah. Um, listen, Eleni, thanks again. It's been absolutely fantastic. And um, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Thank you. I look forward to catching the next uh, talks as well. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.